بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الذي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرض أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني من نور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزاء نعلمك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين We have two issues remaining from Unit 5 One is about the seal of prophethood and the other is about successorship As you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent different prophets and among them we said they were messengers. So 124,000 Nabi, Prophet, 313 Rasul, Messenger. And we said this act of sending prophets and messengers was a requirement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wisdom and also mercy that provides humanity with guidance. He has sent guides to all corners of the world. We have sent to all nations a messenger. But finally, this should reach a point that God communicates to people, to human beings, his complete message, and they would be able to keep it and preserve it. We believe that that happened in the time of Prophet Muhammad And a sign of that is that that is a message which has remained intact and we don't have any doubt about authenticity of the Quran. What remains after that is we need to have sound understanding. So the issue of revelation stopped, but now we have to have sound understanding. We don't need to have new revelation. So we don't have prophet, we have imams that they would give us infallible in, uh, interpretation and presentation. But again, that should gradually reach the point that even we are able to manage without directly asking Imams or being you know, communicated by Imams. So in the life of Imam, you see that gradually the Shia were trained and prepared for the time of occultation. From the time of Imam Jawad and then Imam uh, Hadi and Imam Askari, the contacts between Shia and Imams were very much reduced and Shia were gradually gra uh, trained for having their things sorted out through local representation and local, you know, vakils, you know, agents of Imams. Then the time of Ghaybah started, but again as a kind of preparation, first was minor Ghaybah, al Ghaybah to Sughra, in which Imam appointed specifically one person. And then after that person, another person. This continued for 69 years, from 260 till 329. And then when that preparation also was complete, from 329, we have al ghaybah to Sora, where we don't have access to Imam, and also we don't have anyone who is specifically appointed. Now it is our job to look into qualities, requirements, qualifications, and we should find who is the most qualified person to act as our leader in the absence of Imam Mahdi Jalallah Ta'ala Farjahu Sharif. So it's a gradual process for providing people with humanity but making intervention as little as possible. So there's a process. 
Quran very clearly says that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is the last messenger. For example, chapter 33 verse 40. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Ma kana Muhammadun aba ahadun min rajalikum. Walakin Rasulullah wa khatam al-nabiyyin. Wa kana Allahu bi kulli shay'in alima. Prophet Muhammad is not the father of any of your men. So he has no progeny through a son. Of course, he has progeny through Lady Fatima, sallallahu alayhi wa But he's a messenger of God, Rasulullah, wa khataman nabi'in, and the last prophet. Because he is the last prophet, he should be also the last Rasul. Because every Rasul is also prophet. If no new prophet is going to come, it means that there can be no new Rasul. Because every Rasul is a prophet, but every prophet not, may not be Rasul. Yeah? 313 Rasul, 124,000 prophet. So any Rasul is a prophet. When no prophet is coming, means no Rasul is coming. So he's the last prophet and the last Rasul. Khatam, which is used in this ayah, comes from the root khatm. In Arabic, khatm means to end, to finish. And khatam means something by which you can end something, you can finish something. This is the literal meaning of khatam. But it is also used for seal because they used to have their seal on the ring. So they had their name or their motto, something, you know, their logo and their ring. And when the letter was finished, they used to put their ring as a sign of verification and also showing that the letter is finished so that no one can add to it. So this was added at the end. Therefore, later, gradually, they started using the term khatam for ring and for zina, it means, you know, a kind of adornment. But the root is khatm, something by which you can end and finish. Because Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is the last prophet, so the list of prophets come to an end by sending him, so he is khatamun nabi of the seal of the prophets. Uh, also, we have hadith, many hadith about this. For example, there is hadith from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is mentioned in the book. <coughs> Halalu Muhammadin halalun ila yawm al-qiyamah. Wa haramu Muhammadin haramun ila yawm al-qiyamah. Means basically the sharia of Prophet Muhammad, the law that he brought is uh, effective, is in effect till the day of resurrection. Or you know the hadith of Manzala. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to leave Medina for the battle of Tabuk, as we Tabuk, he asked Amirul Mu'mineen to remain inside Medina and he told Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salam, Anta minni bi manzilati Haruna min Musa illa annahu la nabiyya ba'di. You are to me like Harun, Harun to Moses. Because Harun was the successor of Moses when Moses went to receive the tablets. وَقَالَ مُوسَىٰ لَأَخِيهِ هَارُنَ أَخْلُفْنِي فِي قَوْمِ وَأَصْلِحْ وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ سَبِيلَ الْمُفْسِدِ So, in the same way that Harun succeeded Musa when Musa went to, leave the tab to receive the tablets, you are also succeeding me in Medina after I'm living. But not only this. It's a more general way of successorship. The only difference is Illa annahu la nabiyya ba'di. There is not going to be a prophet after me. Because Harun was a prophet. But Amir al is not a prophet, but he's a successor. And you know, Harun was a prophet who succeeded Musa in that particular event, but he died before Musa alayhi salam. Now, the question is, 
how we can have a religion or a Sharia, a code of law that would not change. Already we have had you know, 14 centuries. We don't know how many more years or maybe even centuries would be between us and the Day of Judgment. Can there be a code of law that would not change? The answer is humanity has a fixed nature in the sense that the same nature that we have human beings had it before and are going to have in future. Therefore, our basic and fundamental needs are the same. The way we can grow morally is the same. If generosity, if honesty, if uh, self, I don't know, monitoring and self-assessment, all these things were good 400 years ago or 400 years ago or 4,000 years ago, it's always going to be the same. So the basic needs are the same. The fundamental needs are the same. Then how to address them can have two parts, fixed parts and changeable parts. Islam is a religion that has a system, a legal system, in which principles are defined, but details, many details are left to people to decide. And the jurist has the job that knowing religion, consulting religion, and facing the challenges that people face, he can go back to the original sources and find the answers for new emerging questions. And one of the things that helps Islam a lot is that Islam actually has a great space for change because only the boundaries are fixed, only the principles are given, and as much as possible, the details are left to people. For example, when it comes to eating, there are few things that you not, should not eat. Anything which is harmful to you, to your health, you should not eat. Anything that you don't own, it's owned by someone else, you shouldn't eat. Then also, for example, wine, alcohol, I don't know, pig, uh, meat which is not slaughtered properly Islamically. There are a few items that you have to avoid. All the rulings of Islam about eating and drinking are very limited. Then you have big a space for deciding what to eat, how to eat, how to cook, what taste, what recipe. It's up to you. What time? Or for example, for dressing. You have to observe modesty. You have to observe few requirements about, for example, material. For example, for men, they shouldn't, you know, wear gold or silk. There are a few items that you have to observe. But then you have thousands of ways of, you know, making your dress. Color, design, many differences can be there. Even you see now, we have, you know, many nations who are Muslims, but they have their own customs, their own traditions. Islam is not fixing everything so that you cannot move, you cannot, you know, be flexible gives you the principles, the main uh, framework. But within that framework, you have lots of uh, space to maneuver. Therefore, the Islamic Sharia helps humanity whose nature is going to be to the same, whose potentials are the same, the virtues and vices for them are the same. It helps humanity to grow. And this is going to remain as principles, but there are details that can change. And we have also the mechanism of ijtihad, when a very well-trained scholar, who is also known to be pious, and who is aware of the situation in the world, he can tell us how to apply those general principles into this varying, you know, details and cases. 
The next issue is successorship to the Prophet Muhammad In the book Islamic Belief System, we deliberately decided not to discuss the issue of Imama. Because Imama is something that Muslims may disagree and we wanted Islamic belief system to be for all Muslims. For Imama, we have another book, an independent book. So here we don't talk about the idea of Imama. Just we raise the question that after the demise of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, two main views were developed. Of course, these views existed even before the demise of the Prophet, but the time they came to the public attention were after the demise of the Prophet. One was the idea of Shia and one was the idea of non-Shia. The Shia had the idea that Imama or successorship to the Prophet is a divinely appointed position. In the same way that people do not vote or select, you know, the prophets, that God knows where to put his mission. Imam is also a divinely appointed position and God decides about it. The Shia believe that prophet on many occasions declared according to the will of God, not according to his personal will or personal choice, according to the will of God, Declare to people that Imam Ali is his successor. And a very important, but not the only, a very important incident was the incident of Khadir. There are many other occasions, but that is very important because it was in a very big gathering and there were many, many people. And that was the last Hajj, the farewell Hajj of Prophet. And they were also asked to pay allegiance to Imam Ali in that particular event. So... In that occasion and other occasions, Rasulullah declared the will of God that Ali has to be followed after him. But the other view is the view that the Prophet left this world without telling people who would be his successor. And historically we know that when the Prophet was passing away, or just shortly after he passed away, while the family of the Prophet were busy with preparing for the funeral, uh, some people gathered in Saqifa. Actually, the people who gathered in Saqifa were the people of Medina, some people of Medina, some Ansar. They gathered in Saqifa and they were trying to decide who would be the successor to the Prophet. They thought the successor now should be someone from Medina. The Prophet was from Mecca and the successor should be from Medina. The news reached uh, the second and the first caliph and they went there and they had a discussion they had a de uh, you know, kind of even fight and finally the people who were there paid allegiance to uh, the first caliph then the first caliph took over and after some time he passed away and before dying he appointed the second caliph the second caliph before he was killed appointed a group of six people and formed a council and said that council should decide who would be the third caliph <coughs> and as you know they offered the caliphate to imam ali but the condition was he should act according to the book of god the sunnah of the prophet and the conduct of the first two caliphs, Sirat al Shaykhain. And Imam Ali said, I would just observe the Book of God and the Sunnah of the Prophet. Therefore, they didn't give him the caliphate, they gave him to Uthman ibn Affan, who became the third caliph. And then the third caliph was killed by some rebels who had gone to Medina as protest. And then people overwhelmingly went to Imam Ali and put pressure on him to accept to become the Khalifa. So in Shia, we have one theory, and that is God should appoint the Imam, the successor of the Prophet. In non-Shia version, you just say that God does not appoint. 
It can be the previous caliph who appoints. It can be a council. It can be, for example, uh, decision of people. It can be different things. The only thing that they agree is that God does not appoint. God would not decide about this. Prophet would not decide about this. But there is no one consistent in a way of saying that it's always decided by people or by elite because there have been different ways. So we just mentioned these two theories. Those who are interested in following up this case, they should refer to the books on Caliphate and on Imamate. And we have also a separate book on this, which inshallah will be available soon. Then we go to the next unit, which is unit six, and that is about resurrection. As you remember, unit one was about the creation, wonders in the world, and there were only scientific data to prepare our mind for reflecting on creation. Unit two was about knowing God, theology. Unit three was anthropology. Unit four was prophethood in general. Unit five was prophethood in particular, a specific prophethood of Islam. And now we go to resurrection. You know that the issue of resurrection is very highly regarded in the Quran. More than 2,000 or about 2,000 verses of the Quran relate to death and resurrection. That is about one third of the Quran. Can you imagine? One third of the whole Quran is about resurrection. This shows how important it is to believe in the resurrection and to act accordingly. There are benefits for personal life and for social life if you believe consciously about the resurrection. For example, if a person believes in the resurrection, in the fact that life is limited, but based on what you do in this limited life, you are going to define your eternal life, then you become very, very careful about every little part of your life. Every minute is important because this minute can have impact for long time. Because, you know, in mathematics, if you have, for example, say 50 years, but the result of these 50 years are going to be seen for an infinite period of time, then it means that every little piece of it has infinite value. Is it clear? If you have, for example, 50 things and you want to divide it into infinite number of people, so each has to be divided to infinite number. Every second of our life is so important that it can change us forever. So we have to appreciate and we have to make sure that we don't waste it or love, we don't use it against our happiness. You know, when you want to have a journey based on the duration of journey, you decide how much provision you need. If you are going to travel to a near place which will take only half an hour and you are going to be there you know, for a few hours, then you need a little journey. If you are going to a far place and you are going to be there for a long time, you need more. If you are going to a place that you are going to be there forever and the only way also to have provision there is to send in advance, then you have to take as much as possible. And even if you take as much as possible, it will not be enough because you want to live there eternally. You need the blessing of Allah to multiply your reward. So every minute, every second of our life has to be used in the best possible way. Therefore, if you believe in the resurrection, if you think about your death, if you think that you have limited opportunity, then you will try to appreciate it and use it in the best possible way. You try also to be very careful in your social life because you have lots of responsibility towards others, your parents, your children, your brothers and sisters, your neighbors, your colleagues, even people that you meet on the street. 
people you meet on the on a bus all the people all even animals all non-living beings you have responsibilities towards them even for example a cup of water you cannot waste it even if you are next to a river you cannot take a cup of water from the river and waste it so we have lots of responsibilities that although they look like challenge but indeed it means that you have lots of opportunities for acting morally and benefit from it because any opportunity for test is at the same time opportunity for getting good results and improving your record with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the people who consciously believe their death then they would not get into crimes they would not get into injustice they would not get into greediness because you know that you are going to use these things in dunya for a limited time, but they are, they are going to suffer endlessly. So you will not be thinking of misappropriating money of people or damaging their reputation and so on and so forth. Inshallah, in the next session, we will have two arguments to prove that there must be resurrection. One is based on wisdom of God. The other is based on justice of God, hikmah and adalah. We leave it inshallah for next session. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين.